regulate uh, that essentially regulates uh, the the total amount of activity in the network, but the specificity of processing is coming from excitatory uh, neurons in their connections. So uh, this view was then reinforced, uh, for example, by studies uh, like this one, this famous study of uh, Tom Bersuch, Flogel, and Sonia Hofer's lab, uh, where they assumed that in visual cortex, for example, specificity is enhanced by specific connections between excitatory neurons with a similar orientation tuning. What they did is they measured orientation tuning of a few neurons in Vivo then cut slices, patched uh, three or four neurons and uh, looked for their synaptic connections. And indeed they found that uh, direct connections between neurons are overrepresented when their orientation tuning is actually similar. However, uh, recently uh, the focus actually moved a little bit more on inhibition. So this is a more recent result from uh, Chris Harvey's lab where uh, they did another experiment also in visual cortex, also uh, using orientation uh, preference, uh, but they measured interactions between neurons, not directly, um, but uh, to a measure that they call influence. So what they did is they, measured, they, they looked at orientation selectivity of neurons uh, using calcium imaging, so many neurons at the same time. And then they stimulated a single neuron using optogenetic techniques and looked what the influence, uh, that is the change in activity, uh, um, was that was created in the other neurons. And in fact, what they found is a, is a decrease in activity, a negative coupling. So this is actually the opposite of what you would expect uh, from this type of connectivity. So how can this be reconciled? Keep it in mind, this is something uh, that we will get back to. So we study uh, the olfactory system, in particular, the olfactory bulb and cortex. The olfactory bulb is the first processing center that receives direct input from the nose. This uh, whitens odor representations, and we'll come to this, which is actually an important pre-processing step for classification. And that is what uh, olfactory cortex is uh, assumed uh, to do, in fact, uh, to learn. So this is assumed to be a, a memory network that would actually uh, learn this kind of connectivity in order to store certain memories, which would be patterns of activity um, during the lifetime of an individual. So uh, one of the first experiments that, that really alerted us to the fact that inhibition may not be just globally regulating overall uh, activity, but be more specifically tuned was uh, performed by Peter Ruprecht. And what Peter did when he was in the lab was uh, <clears throat> to record uh, from individual neurons the synaptic input. So he looked not at the tuning of individual neurons outputs, uh, action potentials in response to some stimuli, but he looked at the tuning of the collective synaptic inputs that a neuron gets uh, from the rest of the network. So here's an example of his, uh, of his recordings. And this would show excitatory synaptic currents evoked by three different odorants and uh, here inhibitory synaptic currents evoked by the same orderings in the same neurons. And what he actually found is that inhibition was not uh, blanket style, but was actually tuned and it was really co-tuned, uh, meaning tuned in the same way to odor stimuli as uh, the excitatory uh, input was. So <clears throat> emerging from this uh, field of, uh, from this type of study was the following uh, view. So, so the canonical idea of olfactory cortex is, as I mentioned, uh, that this is a memory network where activity patterns are stored in these recurrent synaptic connections. I'll show you in a second uh, how this is um, thought to be. But because it's, uh, this is recurrent connectivity, it means that there's an amplification here. And <clears throat> inhibition was always thought to just uh, so, uh, prevent this uh, positive feedback loop here from, um, from exploding essentially. But this, uh, you can easily think that this cannot really um, go very far because if you now think how memories are stored, um, you would, this would be the canonical view of it, uh, very close to a Hopfield network actually. So if, you, if there's a, a certain input active, it would mean that a certain number of neurons here may get stimulated. There, recurrent synaptic connections would then be strengthened. That means they would form an ensemble. And within this ensemble, the amplification of uh, the cognate input for this ensemble would be stronger, uh, perhaps much stronger than the average amplification of a random stimulus uh, to the network. So you can look at this here. 
um, in this diagram where the different directions would represent different inputs. And in some directions, the amplification would be much larger than in other directions. So in these directions, the network may then still explode. And in other directions, perhaps uh, there would be no activity at all. So if inhibition is uniform, this basically cannot work or cannot go very far, I should say. So to make it go a bit further, the only way uh, to, to make this work would be if inhibition is actually not blanket style, but uh, somehow correlated uh, to the excite, excitation in the network in response to different order stimuli. So this would actually uh, require co-tuning of, of neurons as Peter observed over here. And that's uh, a bit the idea that, uh, that we have here. Now, of course, uh, this would mean that inhibition cannot be as simple as this, that there's a, just uh, a blanket style inhibition but uh, the corollary of this is that the inhibitory network needs to be connected very specifically to the excitatory neurons because each excitatory neuron here, each neuron in that network would receive tuned excitatory input uh, from the collective input from many other excitatory neurons in that, in that uh, network. And it has to receive co-tuned inhibitory input from a totally different set, the inhibitory neurons in the same network. So somehow the connectivity about among the excitatory subnetwork and the inhibitory subnetwork uh, has to be tightly coordinated. So this is actually uh, uh, a strong constraint on how such a network should be organized. And <clears throat> another implication of this is that now it is not only excitation that determines the specificity of activity of these neurons, but uh, since inhibition shapes the activity just as, as much as excitation does, inhibition can actually shape the specificity of these uh, responses in the same way. So inhibition uh, may really have more to do than just homeostatic blanket uh, style uh, functions, but it may really be instructive uh, in really fine tuning the computations that such a network may do. So this was the idea that uh, Thomas Frank in the lab had, um, and he wanted to address this uh, role of inhibition in olfactory cortex. And he focused on a subregion in olfactory cortex, an area called dorsal posterior DP, uh, DPDP. DP uh, is uh, the homolog of olfactory cortex in the zebrafish, and, deep, and the lowercase DP stands for, as I said, dorsal, pon uh, dorsal posterior. So what Thomas did to test uh, for memory is to train fish in a memory task. And uh, here's how the task goes. It's actually very simple. This is a fish and it has been, uh, it has received uh, some odor stimuli together with a food reward uh, 30 seconds later. And here now the odor stimulus, the rewarded stimulus is delivered and you can see that the behavior changes. It actually checks out the odor tube here. It swims higher up in the water column. It swims more overall, so mean faster velocity. It sometimes checks the, the location where the reward will be uh, delivered. Um, and this goes on for 30 seconds until the food comes and now it actually eats. So these are the behaviors, these appetitive behaviors that we can nicely quantify. And then we find that the fish is actually learning uh, this associative task uh, very rapidly. So the fish gets one uh, positively rewarded stimulus, uh, odor stimulus and an unrewarded stimulus, and it learns to discriminate between those two uh, within a few trials already during the first day. So Thomas then, uh, oh yeah, and when, it, when we apply the same uh, odor stimuli and the same food rewards, but in a temporally uncoupled fashion, uh, then they don't uh, develop a preference for any of these odor stimuli. So Thomas then uh, performed a variety of experiments uh, where he always used an appetitive odorant uh, that is alanine, and he paired it with one of two uh, neutral odorants in different ways. And um, with each, under each of these conditions, he trained a relatively large number of fish. And after that, he uh, recorded um, the activity in response uh, to these stimuli plus a neutral stimulus uh, in uh, this area DP in a brain explant preparation. And in addition, so he also did the same experiment, same imaging experiments in naive fish that have not, not been trained at all, and in fish that received these uncoupled presentations of odors and food rewards. And uh, what he then observed was, um, was some basic observations. So there were enhanced responses after conditioning in particular to the CS plus. So this would exactly be um, consistent 
with uh, the idea that there are ensembles formed that respond uh, selectively to the CS plus, and there are actually more observations that go exactly in this direction. So this was more or less what you would expect uh, based on the common ideas uh, of olfactory cortex. And this is also in line with it, uh, results that have been obtained, for example, by Don Wilson in rats. Now then Thomas actually went uh, one step further and asked um, more specifically, what is going on in this brain area when uh, these fish learn? So what he then um, looked at was the population activity. This is showing just 50 out of a much larger number of neurons, uh, the responses to these four odor stimuli. He analyzed all of these as population vectors and then characterized the similarity between those, or I should say the distance between those uh, using a simple distance measure, uh, in our case, the cosine distance, because this is independent of the total uh, amplitude of the activity. So in naive fish, he then gets this uh, pattern of distances uh, between uh, the representation of these four stimuli. When he looked in fish that have been trained on alanine as a, uh, as a positively rewarded stimulus, he gets a slightly different, but overall not so different uh, distance matrix. Now, this is the distance matrix he got uh, uh, in fish that were trained on tryptophan as a positive stimulus and alanine as a CS minus. And this, uh, so it's the reverse assignment uh, to those. And here now, all the distances actually increased. So order representations became more distinct from each other. And there was a certain pattern to it. So uh, he then uh, looked at the changes that, were uh, that can be attributed to training by just subtracting the matrix in naive uh, from the matrix in the trained fish. And then here you see that all of these distances actually increase. And <clears throat> the difference here was that uh, in this case, the already appetitive stimulus was reinforced, but here the appetitive stimulus was uh, devalued and the neutral stimulus was reinforced instead. So to see if that pattern holds, he trained uh, fish uh, again on alanine as the negative and now histidine as the positive stimulus, and he got a very similar result. And in the uncoupled trained fish, uh, there's something in between, and that's consistent with the idea that here the appetitive stimulus actually devalued, but the neutral stimulus uh, stays neutral. So uh, now he analyzed this a bit further and wanted to see how do these population uh, responses in these fish actually change under these different conditions? How are they organized when fish are trained in these different paradigms and the values of these stimuli are manipulated? So in order to look at, uh, get a sort of a global, a universal measure of how odor representations are organized in different fish, he looked at these population activity patterns evoked by these uh, four different stimuli that you've just seen. And in each fish characterized the neutral distances between those. And this is a descriptor for the organization of these activity patterns in a high dimensional space that can actually be compared across individuals. And when he did this, um, uh, this is now plotted. Um, he did, oh, sorry, he, he then did a, a principal component analysis uh, to this to just isolate the axis of uh, largest variance. And this uh, is now plotted here on the y-axis. What you see here now is uh, the preference score that each individual fish uh, showed in the behavioral task. And each dot in this plot is now an individual uh, data from an individual fish. And what you see on this axis is that fish that have been trained on alanine as a rewarded stimulus are on this side because a positive score means uh, the fish prefers alanine over uh, another stimulus. And the fish that have been trained on, for example, tryptophan or histidine as a positive uh, stimulus, they are on this side because uh, they like tryptophan or histidine better than alanine. And what you now see is that this behavioral score is very highly correlated uh, to this uh, first principle component in that uh, space. So what that means is that the training reorganizes these older uh, representations so that you can decode the preference for stimuli from uh, these older representations with actually very high accuracy. And in other words, uh, the activity in this brain area DPDP represents both uh, the identity of a stimulus and the valence uh, that the animal assigns uh, to that stimulus. And when we change the valence of a stimulus uh, by assigning it, uh, by pairing it with a food reward, the relationship, so the mapping, if you will, between the odor space onto this valence axis 
changes accordingly. So this was actually an interesting finding. And even in the fish that uh, have received this uncoupled training, so that have not associated uh, stimulus with a reward, what uh, Thomas found is that they have um, lower behavioral scores, but uh, they have some intrinsic preference for either alanine or the other stimulus. And even in those fish, uh, we can map it onto the same principal component analysis, the activity, and uh, we can actually predict uh, whether these fish that have not learned anything will intrinsically prefer alanine or the other stimulus. So that's quite amazing, we thought, because you can basically look into the brain, measure the activity patterns, and predict whether this individual will like that stimulus better or that stimulus better. So uh, what Thomas found, therefore, is that there's a mapping of order space onto a valence axis in this subregion of DP. And uh, this is actually a very plastic mapping because uh, when you change uh, the valence of a stimulus by associative conditioning, you can re get remapping of orders onto this valence axis. So then Thomas went on and asked, uh, is this uh, plasticity of population activity, is this actually dependent on inhibition? And he performed all of these experiments in fish that expressed a hadrodopsin in uh, a majority of the inhibitory interneuron subtypes in this brain area. And <clears throat> what he could therefore do was to measure the activity in response to these four orders, either under control conditions, and then in the very same fish and in the leaf trials, uh, doing uh, a hyperpolarization of the inhibitory interneurons. So he could take those out of the circuit. And when he did this, he uh, observed that the overall activity in the population increased. So he got the disinhibition. Uh, that was uh, not uh, unexpected, of course. And uh, this inhibition is actually uh, relatively complex. I will not go deep into this. Uh, <clears throat> so then he, he wondered, what effect does this actually have on these population distances that I just uh, showed you? So this is now comparing uh, the distance matrix that you've seen before under control conditions, in this case, for naive fish. And in the upper triangle, it is uh, the distance matrix uh, obtained from the same neurons uh, during photo inhibition of the interneurons. So here in naive fish, there's actually not so much of a difference. Uh, we can quantify this again. Now distance is actually decrease when you uh, hyperpolarize the interneurons. Remember during training, uh, training actually increased the distances. And when he now did this uh, experiment for the trained fish as well, he found that this decrease in distances during photo inhibition was actually more pronounced in the trained fish. When you now compare uh, this effect to the effect of training, uh, you find that these are nicely mirror symmetric. And actually, they are kind of very specifically mirror symmetric. This pattern is slightly different from this pattern uh, when you train on this order versus this order. And you find a corresponding difference in the, in the disinhibition over here. So that means uh, there are actually quite specific effects on disinhibition that kind of mirror the effects uh, of training. And this can be quantified for every single uh, order um, representation in, in or distance uh, in every single fish. And overall, you find this very clear negative correlation between the effects of training and the effects of disinhibition. So this means that essentially when you take inhibition out or reduce inhibition in the system, that you sort of undo the effects of training to a certain extent. And when we quantify this, um, again, what we feel, find is that we can actually attribute about half of the effects of training uh, to a change in inhibition. And the other half may then actually be uh, attributable to a change in excitatory network interactions. So this was a quick run through of uh, findings that Thomas Frank made. So to summarize those very quickly, uh, what Thomas found is that in this area DPDP, uh, there is a joint representation of valence and order space such that you can look at this as a mapping of order space onto an axis uh, of valence that's actually dominant in this brain region. And when you reassign valences by associative conditioning, you actually remap order space along this axis. And this uh, involves uh, quite significant uh, contribution from specific inhibition uh, between neurons. So this really reinforces this idea that uh, inhibition can actually play an instructive role in uh, conditioning and not just a homeostatic role uh, in a memory network. So this in turn uh, then uh, 
basically requires that inhibition is not global in a network, but that there's some specific uh, structure uh, in the inhibitory subnetwork that is in a very complex way aligned with the network structure in the excitatory subpopulation uh, of neurons. And of course, this is a major challenge now to figure out how uh, these networks are actually organized at the level of synaptic connectivity between neurons, individual neurons, to achieve this kind of uh, precise uh, synaptic balance. That's actually a technical term for it. So in order to get there, and uh, with other ideas in mind as well, uh, we had actually a, a while ago established a technique uh, that would allow us to tackle exactly these kinds of questions, where we uh, wanted to measure the neuronal activity across neurons in that network, and then also reconstruct uh, the exact synaptic connectivity between the same neurons. And this is an approach uh, that is now up and running for us, uh, and that we call dynamical connectomics because it directly links the connectome, the wiring diagram between neurons to the dynamics uh, of the population activity. So what we do there is uh, conceptually straightforward. We take a brain and uh, perform calcium imaging much the way you've seen it. Um, this can be a trained brain from a fish uh, that's coming out of a behavioral task. And then uh, we take the very same tissue and uh, take three-dimensional stacks of electron microscope images, so volumetric electron uh, microscopy, and reconstruct from that the synaptic uh, connectivity. And then we would have the activity map and we would have a wiring diagram that we can align and uh, combine. So this uh, volume electron microscopy is of course a major challenge uh, technically. And uh, the method we use uh, is the serial block phase electron microscopy approach that Winfried Denk uh, has developed. Uh, as you see here, uh, this works by imaging the block phase in a scanning electron microscope of a tissue block, so not the section. And then inside the vacuum chamber of the microscope, there's an automated ultramicrotome that can cut a very thin section, 25 nanometers, and then we get the next image and uh, we assemble a stack of those. The issue with this technique is that it has to be very reliable and it, it takes a long time to finish a large stack. So uh, actually just this morning, we finished a major stack that took about three months or so, 24 seven uh, fully automated data acquisition to finish. And to set up these methods was actually quite a, quite a uh, achievement of a small team in our group. Uh, these are some of these uh, team members, uh, we had great help from Christelle Genou, who is now at the University of Lausanne, and uh, Alex, uh, who is here in the facility at FMI. So these techniques are now uh, up and running. So one of the pioneers of this technique in our lab was actually Adrian Wanner. And, uh, oh, sorry, this is just uh, an, a movie going through that stack at relatively high resolution. You can see uh, cross sections of uh, axons and dendrites, synaptic vesicles, uh, um, mitochondria, let me just stop it because in Zoom it's sometimes uh, too fast. Um, okay, so there's a lot of detail. And from this we can uh, now reconstruct uh, neurons. Uh, these days we are doing this in collaboration with our uh, friends and colleagues from Google uh, who do this, uh, who have automated segmentation uh, methods to do this. And there is a uh, uh, an enormous amount of detail uh, doing this. But in the past, um, this took a while uh, to develop. And an early pioneer, as I already mentioned, in our lab of this method was Adrian Banner. And uh, what Adrian focused on when he was in the lab was the olfactory bulb. Now, the olfactory bulb, as I said, is the first processing center in uh, olfaction. And uh, the olfactory bulb is a bit different, uh, actually very different in terms of circuit organization from olfactory cortex. And what the olfactory bulb actually does computationally is a whitening of neural activity patterns, perhaps among other things. So what do I mean by this? Um, this is just a little summary of this uh, computation. So the olfactory bulb receives input directly from the nose. In the nose, we have sensory neurons that express, each of them expresses a single odorant receptor. And all the sensory neurons expressing the same odorant receptor then project their axons to common targets in the olfactory bulb, the so-called glomeruli. So we have an array of glomeruli. In the zebrafish, it is a few hundred. In rodents, it's um, 
just over a thousand, uh, it's 2000 or so. And um, each of these uh, glomeruli can be uh, considered an input channel to the circuitry of the olfactory box. Now an odor would activate multiple odorant receptors and therefore multiple of these uh, glomeruli. And these inputs are often highly correlated. Uh, and the reason is probably uh, because similar odors uh, share often these functional groups. These functional groups have a strong impact on the uh, uh, activation of these odorant receptors. And presumably because of this, you often have activity patterns uh, evoked by different odors here across this array of glomeruli that, as I said, overlap a lot. So in this case, for example, they, both of these odors strongly activate these glomeruli, more weakly these glomeruli. And uh, that means they're highly correlated. But the information about the uh, the individual identity of these orders is actually in these relatively small differences here and not in the large differences over there. And that is exactly this uh, kind of issue that uh, can be saw uh, that is, is a problem for, uh, for networks that want to learn to discriminate between these stimuli. And that can be um, alleviated by whitening. Um, so when we look at the output neurons of the olfactory bulb and uh, look at activity patterns across those, what we see there is uh, that uh, we now have activity patterns that are more decorrelated. These large uh, correlations are reduced and actually also their variance is equalized. But uh, I will put this uh, in the background for today's talk. So this is uh, a process that is actually called whitening. And if you look at artificial networks that are trained in uh, discrimination tasks in classification tasks, uh, you actually always find uh, that the early layers of such, uh, such multi-layer networks would also perform a decorrelation or whitening like, uh, like this. So therefore, this is a computation that seems to be universally important uh, for pattern classification, uh, classification tasks. And the idea is therefore that the olfactory bulb kind of performs this whitening to facilitate the learning of different uh, olfactory objects and maybe their associations uh, in higher cortical areas. Now, how is this done? And it turns out uh, that this is actually not a trivial task for a network at all. So within the olfactory bulb, we have uh, interneurons. And these interneurons are mostly GABA or maybe exclusively GABAergic. And uh, these interneurons are extremely important because the mitocells themselves uh, with very few exceptions, do not directly crosstalk to each other. So any transformation of the activity pattern uh, between the input and the output, therefore, has to be mediated by these multisynaptic interactions between microcells that are mediated by interneurons. And therefore, the exact uh, way these interneurons mediate uh, synaptic connectivity here uh, will shape uh, these transformations. And this is what we needed to understand in order to uh, understand whitening. So there are possible, uh, there are different possibilities how whitening uh, could be achieved. And uh, that actually depends on the uh, exact input patterns that a network has. So to get more insights into this, uh, let us just look at some data from uh, the adult olfactory bulb in this case. And uh, <clears throat> in order to, to get a better idea how these, uh, these activity patterns look like and what should be done in order to remove these uh, high correlations. So what you see here is uh, a very old data set, actually 20 years old or more, um, where we recorded uh, the activity of uh, some microcells. These are the output neurons of the olfactory bulb uh, by electrophysiology measured the firing rates in response to different odors. These are 16 different odors on the x-axis. And then we have just performed a little bit of, uh, we, re we arranged the neurons here by a little bit of clustering. And what you then find is uh, sometimes is clusters like this one here. So these are, for example, uh, uh, these are neurons here that respond with high activity to these four odor stimuli. This is exactly the situation that I just showed in the cartoon where uh, similar odor stimuli like these four that actually share a functional group, uh, they would uh, create and uh, evoke relatively high activity in a subset of neurons. Um, 
So, so this is uh, what you've just seen. So therefore, uh, but the same uh, odors would actually evoke some lower activity in other neurons. And, other neur and the same neurons would actually respond more specifically to other subsets uh, of odors. So how can the correlations that arise from this strong activity here, how can they be removed? So for a long time, it had been proposed that the olfactory bulb does a contrast enhancement. Mainly, uh, this was a borrowing ideas from, from the visual system where the retina performs contrast enhancement. And uh, we can, of course, try this out because contrast enhancement is a global operation. You can just scale the activity of every single neuron uh, using uh, some function. And you then uh, obtain a contrast enhanced uh, image uh, as in Photoshop. And when we actually use Photoshop to do this, we find that we actually don't do ourselves a favor. This uh, cluster here becomes more prominent and we actually make the situation worse. These patterns are more difficult to discriminate than these. So contrast enhancement is actually not a solution. It's counterproductive. So what else could we do? So you can now think, uh, what if we could su selectively suppress the activity of these neurons uh, in response to these odors? So we just downregulate the activity again by Photoshop. Now we compare um, the results to what uh, the olfactory bulb really does. And in order to do this, uh, we can actually uh, take, we are lucky because the zebrafish olfactory bulb is very slow. We can see the, the activity pattern before decorrelation. When we look at a time window very just after response onset, and we can then see the decorrelated pattern a few hundred milliseconds later, 500 milliseconds later in this case. And then we find that uh, actually this manipulation that we just did here by hand is not such a bad approximation of uh, the transformation that the circuitry in the olfactory bulb uh, really does. But this now raises again a question because this is unlike a contrast enhancement, is not a simple scaling of the activity of, uh, of each neuron, but uh, the activity of each neuron should be modified depending on the activity of several other neurons, not all other neurons, but a subset of other neurons. So the activity of these neurons here should be downregulated if and only if uh, the activity of the other neurons in this cohort here is also high. Uh, if the activity of other neurons in this cohort is low, then the activity should actually survive, uh, which, it, which it does. So in order to achieve such a modification of uh, activity patterns, you need actually some specific connectivity between neurons. So this is just a very simple uh, example to illustrate to you that uh, we can essentially uh, derive from our results that the network must involve some specific uh, uh, connections, interactions between neurons that cannot be explained by first order statistics such as mean neural activity or standard deviation of neural activity. So, how we therefore set out and uh, or Adrian did this uh, and try to resolve this connectivity matrix in order to mechanistically explain how this whitening can be uh, achieved. So what Adrian did is uh, he he didn't use he actually developed uh, the uh, a large part of the uh, dynamical connectomics pipeline that we now have. And he used it to reconstruct all the neurons in the olfactory bulb, this time in a zebrafish larva, simply to make the task uh, smaller. This was uh, just over a thousand neurons. And he then also identified all the synaptic connections. And he obtained um, this uh, object here, which is actually the wiring diagram, the connectivity matrix between these neurons. So you see here, the microcells are not connected uh, to each other, as I mentioned, they don't make direct uh, synaptic connections. This is why this quadrant here is actually empty. But over here, now you see the connectivity between the microcells uh, and the interneurons and the interneurons back to the microcells and also the interneurons are connected uh, to each other. So this was now, uh, this was really a great achievement. And before he did this, Arian actually did calcium imaging to measure the odor evoked activity uh, across about one third of the neurons in the whole circuit. And then he could map uh, the calcium imaging data set onto the EM data set. So in the calcium imaging, he essentially repeated uh, uh, a scheme 
that uh, we had used many times before in adult zebrafish uh, and to study this whitening and pattern decorrelation. So <clears throat> Adrian therefore first asked, uh, does he also see the whitening and pattern decorrelation in, in the larval zebrafish? And in fact, he did. So uh, this, is, this shows odor responses uh, over time here uh, across interneurons and microcells in response to these eight different odor stimuli. And they were chosen such that these four stimuli, the bile acids, uh, are actually very similar to each other. They're dissimilar from this second group of, uh, of stimuli. And individually, these ones are more dissimilar from each other than the bile acids. So Adrian then defined these two time windows, one time window very early uh, after odor onset, and one time window he chose uh, about 1.5 seconds, I think, later, uh, because in this time window, the mean activity was actually the same or statistically not different. So any effects could therefore not be uh, attributed to a change in the mean activity. When he compared the correlation between odor representations, then he saw the characteristic decorrelation very similar to what we saw also in, um, in adult fish. And these are the correlation matrices. Uh, in particular here, these stimuli you see in the early time bin evoke highly correlated activity patterns. And this is then decorrelated in the second time bin. So these fish, uh, therefore, the olfactory bulb already performs pattern decorrelation in larva fish. And now we could ask, uh, can this actually be explained by, uh, by the wiring diagram by, uh, when we look at uh, that should give us information about specific interactions? And to ask this question in perhaps boldest possible way, uh, Adrian then went on and uh, performed a very, and, and set up a very simple simulation. So the idea here was uh, to represent individual neurons and synapses in the most, in the simplest possible way. So each neuron was uh, represented by a, a threshold linear rate model. All the synaptic strength uh, of, of the same type of neuron um, were the same. And uh, the, there were only two types of neurons in the circuit, microcells and interneurons. So by keeping the representation of the single neurons as simple as possible, uh, you could, uh, the idea was uh, that if then this neuron, this network performs any computation, it uh, should be uh, really attributable uh, to the wiring, to the connectivity between these neurons. So this is what Adrian then uh, tested out. Uh, this is a simulation uh, of the total activity as a function of time in response uh, to auto stimuli. Nothing uh, peculiar here. This is the pattern correlation as a function of time. And in fact, uh, this decorrelates uh, as, uh, as, as it should. So Adrian then first uh, tested the uh, contribution of interneuron to interneuron connections, essentially found that they changed the overall activity, but the decorrelation was not affected uh, when he took them out of the circuit. So therefore, that made our life a lot easier. So we then omitted those. The next thing Adrian tested was uh, when he randomized the connectivity in the network, what would happen? And this time, uh, correlation, decorrelation was actually completely abolished. This is uh, shown here uh, in this bar graph. This is the input correlation. This is the correlation during time, uh, time two, and there's uh, no decorrelation at all. So Adrian, then uh, we, could, we could then make it more specific. So we actually... Uh, there's a the, in the crosstalk between these neurons uh, is mediated by these disynaptic connections via interneurons. So we permuted the connectivity such that the total amount and distribution of disynaptic connectivity in the network stayed exactly the same. But uh, the combinations of microcells that disynaptically inhibit each other, this was randomized. And when we do this approach, uh, we actually also lose uh, the decorrelation. So that means that uh, the pattern of disynaptic inhibition in the network has to be adapted to the exact uh, pattern of, of input activity that is received from the glomeruli, because this is what we gave as input. And in fact, when we uh, keep the connectivity the same and we permute uh, the glomeruli inputs, instead we get the same results. So, so therefore the connectivity is kind of tailor -made, tailored uh, to, the, to the input patterns. Now, how can this work? Uh, to dig deeper into this, uh, Adrian um, then looked at connectivity motifs that could mediate this disynaptic inhibition between microcells uh, here. 
And uh, this brings up one important feature of the circuit, which is that uh, quite often interneurons make uh, synapse onto microcells and the microcell makes uh, nearby a reciprocal synapse onto the same individual interneuron. So these reciprocal synapses are quite prominent within the olfactory bulb. And what Arian found is that uh, motifs, uh, these triplet motifs, uh, are overrepresented particularly strongly when uh, for those motifs that contain these disynaptic, this, uh, sorry, these reciprocal uh, connections. The other observation that Arian made is that uh, mitral cells uh, were more likely, actually a lot more likely, to be disynaptically connected via an interneuron. Uh, when their tuning uh, was more similar. And this observation kind of uh, uh, raised, raised some memories because you may think, aha, this is something that I've seen before in my textbook. Uh, we have similarly tuned neurons connected via inhibitory interneurons. This looks like lateral inhibition that actually does contrast enhancement. But we've just seen contrast enhancement is actually not uh, what happens here. It's actually even counterproductive. So how can this be explained? And the explanation is actually very simple. So uh, in a standard contrast enhancement uh, circuit, uh, there would be a slight asymmetry in the inputs and that would be enhanced uh, because there's a winner take all uh, effect uh, that one neuron suppresses the activity of the other neuron. But for this to work, the connections uh, from one neuron to the other and the connections in the other direction have to be strictly separate. They have to be unidirectional because if this neuron is silent, uh, then this connection still needs to be intact. What we have in the olfactory bulb though, are these reciprocal connections here. And then it is actually irrelevant uh, in which direction the asymmetry is because in either way, this neuron gets activated and it will always distribute the same inhibition back uh, to all the neurons here. So a circuit like this, uh, will actually suppress the activity of all neurons that are connected into a cohort like that. So by this uh, seemingly subtle difference uh, that here the inhibition is via separate neurons, here it's via the same neurons, you can actually receive a very different computational outcome uh, in this uh, connected uh, set of neurons. So what we actually find in the, in the uh, olfactory bulb is this type of connectivity that we have neurons that have similar uh, tuning to stimuli that connect reciprocally to a subset of interneurons. And these interneurons may then actually uh, uh, inhibit uh, back exactly these same neurons. And, then, uh, and this inhibition, because this is overrepresented, should be stronger for these neurons than for most of the other neurons in the circuit. And that is actually exactly the kind of uh, modification that we want to get uh, this effect. Because uh, if this would be our cohort now, if this should be strongly activated, this would downregulate its own activity without uh, affecting the other neurons in the circuit uh, so much. So uh, this is then uh, what could be tested uh, again in the simulations. And, uh, <clears throat> and this is just showing last data slide, the, uh, that this is actually the mechanism uh, that, that can explain the observations. This is now data. Here we have sorted uh, 200 or so neurons that, that were recorded. This is an example where we apply two different stimuli and uh, the activity is uh, uh, correlated in the early time bin. And uh, we have sorted the neurons by their contribution to the correlation over here. And the, the first thing you see is that the con strongest contribution is actually coming from neurons that are strongly active. And, uh, now, when you look at the decorrelated states in the second time bin, uh, the activity of most of, of the neurons is not changing dramatically. It's changing a little bit, but not much. And the biggest effect is actually a downregulation of the activity of these ones that contribute highest, most highly to the correlation. And therefore, uh, the overall correlation decreases. This is showing uh, now the distribution of activity uh, for using the uh, sorting for different order pairs. And you see that this uh, effect is quite pronounced and can ex actually explain essentially all of the pattern decorrelation that we see, or most of it. And uh, we can now see if, the, uh, if this mechanism of decorrelation is actually reproduced in the simulation, and in fact it is. So it is exactly the same set of neurons that in the simulation uh, become suppressed 
and therefore this mechanism is uh, is actually the same in the simulation. We can then dissect this in much more detail also by cutting individual uh, subsets of, of very specific connections and so on. But all of this uh, essentially supported that uh, mechanism uh, for whitening. So in summary, therefore, uh, the whitening mechanism can be explained by this fairly specific connectivity among cohorts of co-tuned uh, excitatory neurons that make reciprocal disynapse uh, connections with uh, uh, subsets of inhibitory neurons. And this suppresses this uh, dominant activity that probably represents functional groups and therefore brings out uh, the, in the, the auto-specific uh, components of activity patterns uh, more clearly. Uh, so therefore, we get a contrast reduction, and uh, that is actually also observed uh, experimentally. So just to put this in a broader context, uh, in a visual system, we often think that contrast is important, and actually it is. Uh, if you have an image like this, you could say, um, um, you could look at this image and, and ask what is most uh, strongly represented in these pixels that we see in this image. And then you would say background, because most values uh, actually uh, re represent this uh, diffuse background. So what the visual system does is therefore it enhances uh, contrast, for example, along these contours to transmit efficiently the information about features in this image that are particularly informative, for example, to identify the zebra fish. But you could just as well, you could also reduce the background, which is actually also done by high pass filtering uh, to bring this out. And in the olfactory system, this seems to be a dominant mechanism in the olfactory bulb because here high correlations uh, that actually represent redundant information are presumably driven by these functional groups. And if uh, a circuit can uh, suppress, uh, not suppress, I should say, reduce the representation of these functional groups, then um, the overall representation would reflect more the uh, individuality of these uh, stimuli. Um, now this, circuit here, this uh, circuit motif, if you will, maybe you have noticed that this is actually the opposite of uh, this type of circuit motif that I've shown you before. And this circuit motif could uh, actually uh, generate exactly the kind of interactions that have been seen by Chris Harvey's group in, uh, in visual cortex. So it is possible, and we, I would say it's likely that actually this circuit motif and this circuit motif may coexist in many circuits because this one again could, uh, for example, uh, prevent a circuit uh, from exploding if it has too many of these type uh, of motifs. Now, this motif can be detected by paired recordings and similar methods. This one here, because it involves many neurons and uh, multisynaptic interactions can only be uh, seen anatomically by dense reconstruction. So, so this is therefore, uh, an insight uh, that really required uh, dense reconstructions of neural networks. So to summarize uh, this part of, uh, of the talk, uh, we found a mechanism that can, at least in part, probably to a large extent, explain uh, whitening of auto representations in the olfactory bulb. Uh, what I find intriguing here is that uh, this connectivity in the olfactory bulb is tailored to the input. So it kind of represents a memory of molecular features, but uh, it is probably hardwired because it's seen already at very early stages of development. So it is uh, like a memory that has been acquired during evolution and not uh, during the life of an individual. And um, this highlights uh, the potential of this dynamical connectomics approach, which we are now using also to address uh, a large variety of uh, other questions. And uh, perhaps this motif here, uh, this feature suppression motif, could be uh, the flip side of the coin uh, of this uh, feature amplification motif. And the two of them may actually be required to interact, uh, to coexist, uh, to generate uh, memory networks uh, that have to solve uh, this particular problem. So with that, uh, I would like to thank the people who were involved in this, uh, in particular, Thomas, uh, who is now group leader at the Max Planck uh, for Neurobiology in Martinsried, uh, Adrian, who, uh, who was in Princeton, actually now is back in, in Switzerland, uh, 
uh, Peter is uh, in Zurich, uh, a postdoc at the University of Zurich. Uh, Benjamin and some others, uh, including also Nila, uh, uh, con contributed uh, a lot to the circuitry construction pipeline. With that, uh, thanks to you, and I'm open for any questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Reiner, for this fantastic uh, <coughs> talk. I personally enjoyed it a lot and I hope other people also did the same. So. So, yeah, I guess this was dense, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, please ask Sorry. questions. Yes, hi, Rainer, I have a question. So uh, I, it's really fascinating how these groupings appear potentially to have emerged during evolution, but I'm just curious, how fixed are they? So if during development, if there's correlation, if you can manipulate the correlation between inputs, do you see any change in the, 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 the connectivity patterns that emerge during development or is it fully hardwired, do you think? That, um, well, that's a great question. So we have done this reconstruction at a, at a age of 4.5 days after fertilization. The system starts to, re the olfactory bulb starts, to, which is not long after hatching, and the olfactory bulb starts to respond just before hatching. So two days before we reconstructed this. So we, we think that this is far too little time for activity dependent processes to have a major influence on, on this. We don't know this, but um, the dynamics connect. So as I mentioned, this was an early, application of dynamical uh, connectomics. Now our pipeline allows us to do everything minimum 10 times faster, uh, more like 100 times faster. So one experiment that's going on now is to essentially re repeat this experiment actually with more neurons and more orders uh, in multiple individuals. And then we can uh, directly compare uh, between individuals how variable this is and potentially how it depends on prior experience. So my guess is that actually, as I said, this is a hypothesis, a working hypothesis at the moment that the experience doesn't contribute too much. One interesting finding was that uh, there's a huge population of interneurons in the adult olfactory bulb, the so-called granule cells, that essentially don't exist yet at this early stage. They come later in development. In fact, they're added throughout life, even in, in adults. And our hypothesis right now is that these are the neurons uh, that mainly shape processing in the olfactory bulb in an experience dependent fashion. Much like uh, newborn neurons in dentate gyrus can throughout life shape information processing in the hippocampal uh, circuitry and lay down memories. So this would, uh, this would be a quite an interesting hypothesis uh, to test. Uh, we are looking, uh, we are also working on that. Very cool, thank you. At the moment, hypothetical though. Could I ask a question also? Mm -hmm. Hello, yeah. Yes. So, um, so you said that those are the interneurons, so they're not granule cells in the olfactory bulb, there's some other interneurons, no? Yes, exactly. These I are, see. So there, uh, there are these two populations of, uh, of neurons that we distinguish, the upper layer interneurons that sit in the glomerular layer. So this will be periglomerular and short axon cells. Um, each of those are large groups. Mm -hmm. And then there are the granule cells. And we, it was actually one of the results of this uh, complete circuit reconstruction that at this early stage, we found essentially no granule cells. Mm -hmm. By now, uh, we have been following this up during development. And we find that at about two weeks of, of age, roughly uh, or 10, 10 days, between 10 days and two weeks, uh, we see the start of a second wave of interneurons populating the olfactory bulb that then continues for a while. And those populate the deeper layers. So in the deeper layers, we therefore have the granule cells. And the upper layer interneurons were often thought to maybe be a minor population and they are minor in terms of number, but the strength of the inhibition that is uh, coming from the upper layer is actually high compared to the strength of the inhibition coming from the granule layer, even though the granule cells are far more numerous. Interesting. So uh, are the neurons oscillatory because granule cells contribute a lot to mm -hmm. the oscillatory nature of the response? Yeah, exactly. So the granule cells are probably the main contributors uh, to, to the, at least the fast oscillatory rhythm, the uh -huh. uh, 
And in fact, in the fish, we, try, we started, we, we recorded oscillation at different developmental stages, and we found that they emerge also during only later in development, actually perfectly in parallel with the emergence, with the integration of granular cells into granular cells. So the four days when you get these kind of a granular granular cells, when that's when the uh, oscillation hasn't emerged, no? Yeah. I see. So is there any interesting olfactory behavior? Because you're, earlier you talk about this behavior training with uh, food mm -hmm. and reward and all this. So at uh, four days old, when you're mapping all these circuit formations for, uh, you call that mutual suppression, any olfactory behavior to correspond to that? Um, that's hard to say because not too many behavioral studies have been done at this early age. Mm -hmm. um, there are innate responses uh, that are attractive or repulsive to some of the odors. This is, this is known. Mm -hmm. uh, other odors uh, seem to evoke just higher swimming activity, but uh, that doesn't seem to be directed. Mm -hmm. But uh, as you know, I guess the, the, um, you're probably perfectly aware of the fact that it is very hard uh, mm -hmm. to teach anything to larval zebrafish. Certainly, uh, mm -hmm. Drew and Jen know this. Uh, uh, so, so at these stages around five days of post-fertilization or so, uh, most fish have a hard time to learn any, say, association or so. Mm. So therefore, it's difficult to do uh, any behavioral uh, experiment at this stage that involves learning, uh, presumably because uh, the fish just don't show this learning behavior yet, or it's, very, it's not very prominent yet at, at these early stages. Mm -hmm. This changes then also, actually, uh, curiously enough, this changes then also uh, during a relatively narrow time window in development that mm -hmm. again coincides uh, with the integration uh, of the granule cells and the emergence of oscillatory activity in there. I see. Roughly what That's date? Seven or eight days? Or what, what date do the granule cells emerge? Uh, well, it starts at, let's say, 10 to 12 days. 10 to 12 days. And then, uh, and then it continues uh, for a few weeks. So the highest rate of integration of granular cells, I would say, is probably between three and five weeks. That's exactly the time you know, when, when learning, and that's not only the olfactory modality, it's actually uh, also another modality that uh, uh -huh. are probably. So therefore, all these decorrelation and stuff, we may may or may not be having any behavioral cor uh, correspondence, and they're yet to be found out. As in the in the larvae, it's possible that it may not have uh, behavioral correspondence. Mm. In the but it may be simply a circuit that is set up early in development, mm. but becomes relevant then only later in development because we know That's in the good. adult fish it actually has behavioral correspondence very clearly. So we have tested um, the decorrelation for many different order pairs. Mm -hmm. And then another lab, um, Tine Valentinjic in Slovenia, has actually done behavioral experiments testing the ability of zebrafish to discriminate between the same set of order pairs. And he found that the fish could actually not learn only two different, two specific order discriminations out of 50 something that he tested. And these were exactly the two order discriminations where we saw no decorrelation. So, so therefore, there was a very clear correspondence between decorrelation and, and the ability to learn a task. And uh, similar experiments have also been obtained by Alan Carton's lab in mice. So I think there's actually a pretty good correspondence between the occurrence of this decorrelation and the ability to learn a discrimination in adult animals. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I, I'm interested about the decorrelation time in larvae versus adult fish, I think in larvae you have um, said that it's uh, 1.5 seconds or so, where you saw like the maximal uh, decorrelation um, after 1.5 seconds. Uh, or so. Not, not so. We chose the time window to be 1.5 or so seconds. Mm -hmm. I don't remember exactly 1.5, 1.7, but um, the decorrelation is actually a bit faster than that. We chose the time window to make the mean activity equal, so we can rule out any effects of uh, of Overall, ah, yeah. yeah. And if you compare that to the adult performance, is the, the timing of the decorrelation uh, then similar or is it like quicker in larvae? Or? The, the adult was a bit faster, but uh, there's, there's a, 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 there's a so various things to consider. So, so first of all, we don't 
create step, stim step stimuli in, in olfaction. And the reason is a technical one because uh, we pass our odor stimuli through narrow tubes. Water has a very high viscosity. And because of this, there's actually a strong low pass filtering of the stimulus that we pass through the tube uh, when it arrives at the nose. So it's smeared out in time. And therefore it has a rise time of about in the adult 500 milliseconds. And that's, that's actually a bit, so in the adult it takes about 400 milliseconds. When we stimulate optogenetically, we get the decorrelation much faster. The second thing and that is that I also didn't mention, actually olfaction is super slow in at least in larvae and perhaps also in adults. There's an experiment that was done by Emre Yaxi where he stimulated in a larva that has a very simple olfactory pit so you can directly blow odors with very little mechanical hindrance uh, at, at that uh, thing. So he blew odors from a pipette at, uh, at the larval nose and then uh, he uh, provided puffs and varied the interval to measure something like the flicker fusion frequency to see how fast can the sensory neurons follow uh, pulse odor stimulation. And he found that uh, he got fusion when the inter pulse interval was something like eight seconds. So, so the temporal resolution of these sensory neurons is extremely slow. And therefore I think, uh, a decorrelation time of 400, 500, 800 milliseconds, even if this is, is probably overestimated, and it is in any case, it is essentially negligible to the temporal resolution that the system actually has. So, so therefore, I think this is, uh, this is relatively fast. And in mice, uh, I can tell you, Alan Carton's lab has measured this in mice. There it happens. Uh, very rapidly within the initial phase of a theta cycle. So uh, 50 milliseconds or something like that. Mm -hmm. And behaviorally in the adults, when you uh, see them, um, the performance of the animal, like when you can see that they got the task or did it? Pardon? Uh, so this was, the, yeah? No, no, I mean, I, I, I mean in the adult zebra fish, but we had the, the, the um, stimulus, when they, when they, uh, how quickly, I'm wondering how quickly they then respond ah, to the ah, okay. like how you can relate that maybe to the decorrelation time. Uh, no, this we cannot relate because the temporal resolution of the behavioral assay is, uh, is very slow. Uh, I've, I've briefly shown you the task that we have uh, established in our lab, which, were, which was infusion of odor in the tank. And then we measure the behavior of the fish for 30 seconds before it gets a reward or not. And, um, Tina Valentinges, uh, who measured this uh, more systematically than we did, uh, the ability to discriminate between odors, he used a very similar task. Actually, ours, ours was, uh, was uh, modified from the task that he developed before. So he measured uh, actually behavioral responses over a period of 90 seconds, even slower than we had. So we cannot, uh, dis not, uh, not, we, we cannot resolve, uh, resolve the, the behavior at the temporal scale. I understand, thank you. Great. <clears throat> are there any further questions? Um, if not, then we are going to conclude this talk. And again, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Reiner, for giving this talk. Great pleasure, thank you.